Good afternoon, Hendrick Hudson community. I'm Joseph Hockreiter, Superintendent of Schools, and thank you for joining us today for the first of three parent forums to discuss our reopening schools plan and our update, a lot of hard work that our staff has been engaged in. I want to thank everyone for uh, submitting questions. We received around 140 questions, just shy of 140 questions. And if your question didn't make it today, we're also having another discussion and forum tomorrow at four o'clock and also Monday early evening at 6 p.m. So uh, you can use the link that was provided to you to submit those questions. We're gonna try our best to get to all of them. Uh, the purpose of today is to take your questions and the feedback uh, and organize them into different themes and topics. And we have uh, our entire district office administration with us. Uh, a number of them are here and a number of them are remote to make sure we're practicing social distancing. Uh, with us live is Anthony Merlini, Elizabeth Gillio, and Enrique Catalan. And with us remote is Lisa Shookman, Margaret Roller, and Laura Nyer. Uh, before I get going and, and get into the document, I want to give an update uh, to our community. Uh, there seemed to have been some miscommunication at the New York State Department of Health. Uh, Hendrick Hudson was one of about 100 school districts uh, that was identified in error of not submitting its Department of Health plan on time. Uh, we communicated that to our families and I know I heard from some of you asking what the status was. I wanted to give you that status. Uh, today at 10.48 a.m. I received an email from the Department of Health that stated they wanted to close the loop. They did receive our submission from Hendrick Hudson. However, all of the reviews are still pending. So they acknowledge that they received our submission on time. They also acknowledge that they have not approved anyone's submission uh, because uh, they are all pending and we have over uh, 700 school districts in New York State. I also want to comment a little bit about on our format today. Uh, there were questions around having a live event, which is not permissible under the uh, governor's executive order. Uh, but also why we chose to do this format, and I'll, I'll share that. Uh, when the governor last Friday announced that schools may reopen, uh, either through a hybrid model or through a remote learning plan, uh, he was mandated that, or he mandated to districts that they hold three community forums. And his statement is that uh, schools must also have three to five meetings, the five meetings are for large school districts, uh, three to five meetings prior to August 21st, uh, and parents can uh, be allowed to participate remotely. Um, so we just have a technical issue. Can you turn the volume down real quick? Uh, so we want to let everyone know that these meetings are remote because the governor said that they need to be remote. Um, we can't have in-person meetings yet. There are a number of executive orders that have been extended, uh, and that's why we're here today. With that, we'll get into the meat and potatoes of our presentation. Uh, as I mentioned, our team is with us, a little bit remote, a little bit um, with us in person here. And we want to celebrate some of our uh, successes. This is uh, a really great photo of some of our students from last spring uh, performing in a vocal music class uh, that uh, our teachers were using some really dynamic technology to, uh, to make that happen. What I think we have to uh, step back and take a breath and understand is that we are still in a pandemic. Uh, as much as the state has done a phenomenal job of flattening the curve and lowering the infection rate, we are still in a pandemic. And I don't need to tell uh, anyone um, that we're not out of this yet. <clears throat> we don't have to look very far uh, to see other states that continue to struggle or states that were very successful and now the infection rate is creeping up. A number of states very, very close to where we are in New York still remain on the governor's do not travel list. In fact, today, New Jersey announced a reversal of their education plan and they are uh, providing school districts in New Jersey with choice to start virtual or remote if they choose. Uh, we're still in a pandemic. This is a temporary situation that we're in, as uncomfortable as it is. We hope that it's temporary. We're asking everyone for patience and flexibility. This is a very emotional time. It's a very taxing and stressful time. Um, schools used to be one of the only institutions that we could rely on. Schools were open from September to June. 
kids were in buildings from 8 o'clock to 3 o'clock. We had concerts, we had sports. Our society, our culture could rely on schools. And that right now is no longer the case, given the fact that we're in a pandemic and we're trying to open schools in a creative, but very health conscious and safe way. So we ask for your continued patience and flexibility. And we're gonna get through this by being together in this community, uh, has rallied together for many, many instances to support people, to support community members. Uh, I know that together we're going to be able to open our schools. We're going to be able to do this safely. We're going to be able to do it with all of the guidance that we've been asked to consider. And again, this is temporary. We know that uh, our pot of gold will be at the other end of the rainbow. It's just an awfully long rainbow these days. We had to take a lot of things into consideration uh, in building these plans. And there are many, many uh, beliefs and viewpoints that differ. We conducted a number of surveys asking families what their intentions were, what their likelihood was of returning to school. Uh, and basically, if it wasn't a 30-30 split, it was a 50-50 split. And soon, uh, we'll release the survey data from our August survey that shows uh, that about 51% of families would choose to come back to school and 49 families would choose to remain remote. We have received very, very passionate emails from parents and families and uh, we thank you for those. Um, this community cares. They want to make sure their students are safe. They want to make sure their students stay healthy. They want to make sure that their students are not on CNN or the NBC Nightly News uh, for not doing the right thing as they reopen. Uh, just about every night on the news you can look at a high school or a middle school or a group of students um, that isn't taking this seriously and we do not want to be that district. We also uh, had to consider student and parent choice. For the first time perhaps ever in public education, students and families have a choice as to whether they come to school to receive instruction or they stay at home. That is a major paradigm shift in our profession and I cannot express that enough. One of the only professions that we all have a working knowledge of is working in a school because all of us went to a school. For those that are here working, have gone to college to be a teacher or a counselor, a psychologist, or this is a second or third career. We know how schools should operate based on our innate and unique experiences and right now those experiences may not be what they were. We're taking uh, expert advice from public health officials and we'll share all of the different guidance that we've received from the Department of Health from uh, New York State to Westchester County to the CDC we have a lot of information that we have to review uh, in a short period of time to make uh, really good decisions for kids pressure there's a lot of pressure it's almost mid-August the governor less than a week ago gave final approval to open schools and throughout New York State and even the country, schools are scrambling to do the best they can with the resources they have with a finite period of time. That finite period of time is that school starts in September. Uh, we'll have a discussion uh, about how we reopen school perhaps a little bit later. And again, this is temporary. We're going to learn a lot about this experience, uh, a lot of takeaways that will make our profession better, that will hopefully make our students um, more astute and, and perhaps uh, better learners, uh, but it stretched us all. And the stress and the anxiety and the tension uh, is very, very obvious. It's very evident and we feel that with you while we try to make sure we open schools safely. Speaking of guidance, we've received a lot of input and mandates uh, from all of these agencies, the New York State Department of Health, the New York State Education Department, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has given us guidance, uh, OSHA, the Federal Occupational Safety and Health Administration, as well as the Westchester County Department of Health and various uh, executive orders from the governor. And speaking of the Westchester County Department of Health, please make sure that you check our website, our COVID dedicated website. Uh, we just posted yesterday very important and detailed information about COVID testing and contact tracing because uh, that was at odds with uh, some comments the governor made a week ago, so we wanted to clarify that. So this presentation is broken into about eight chunks, and these chunks uh, came from 
uh, the survey that we asked you to submit questions for. So we're going to spend some time talking about our remote learning plan. We're going to talk about serving the needs of all of our special education students. Significant amount of time, energy, and focus must be dedicated to training and preparedness. Uh, transportation, uh, we transport around 2,000 students every day to school, so we're going to touch on transportation. PPE and safety supplies, as well as technology. Uh, we are one of few districts that was able to adapt and adjust very, very swiftly to make sure kids had technology in their hands uh, during uh, the crisis last spring. And we have cleaned those computers. We purchased some more to make sure kids uh, have an operating computer for this fall as well. Uh, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about COVID testing and contact tracing, and lastly, we're going to talk about the numbers. We're going to talk about budget and finance and the impact that our preparedness uh, and some of the mandated purchasing that we've had to do uh, and how that's had an input or impact, I'm sorry, on our budget. So let's get started. So the first piece uh, of our conversation today uh, is to talk about a remote learning plan. Uh, the governor in his announcement said schools need to have a remote learning plan and we need to be ready to execute that learning plan on a moment's notice. Uh, we executed a digital remote learning plan last spring with two days notice uh, and it was a work in progress, but I'm very, very proud of how our teachers and our students responded. We know that it wasn't perfect. We know that it wasn't ideal. We received a lot of uh, constructive uh, feedback around what needed to be improved, and we hope that you see those improvements uh, in our digital remote plan. So, uh, in terms of our district-wide plan, it complements our hybrid plan. Hybrid plan is for uh, when schools are open. Uh, the remote learning plan is for when schools are closed. It will include daily scheduled synchronous instruction. What that means is that students, while they're at home, will follow their bell schedule if they're in middle school or high school, or they will follow their teacher schedule or school schedule at any three of our elementary schools. They are mandated to participate, they're mandated to be present, and they're mandated to do their work and hand it in. Those are mandates from the state education department. That was feedback that the state education department heard from families as well as school districts. Uh, so they are taking the lead on that effort to make sure that all kids in New York State understand the expectations and that all schools are playing by the same rules should a remote learning plan need to be used. It also calls for in-person learning focus around our elementary special ed and ENL students. I talked about the accountability piece. And uh, earlier on in this slide, I talked how the governor al is allowing school districts to choose this plan. While the governor said schools may open, he said that if schools don't want to open, they can open with their remote learning plan. If you remember last year, it was a governor's executive order that closed school, and it was only through that executive order were we allowed to use our remote learning plan. The governor has clearly said that a district may begin the school year using the remote learning plan. Uh, that is uh, a, a important information um, to discuss because there are districts near us uh, who are considering this. They're considering starting September remotely and very uh, methodically phasing in different students to the learning environment uh, to make sure their systems are in check, to make sure that their teachers are ready and comfortable and confident, uh, and that perhaps may be uh, a model that um, that we choose to explore in Hendrick Hudson. Oh, I just hit the wrong button. Uh, parent choice, remote learning parent choice. We heard from a number of parents, many parents, and our, as I mentioned earlier, our survey data uh, indicated anywhere between 30 and 50 percent would choose a remote learning plan if schools were open. So this is for families who would like to keep their child at home while school is open. Families would opt in. That documentation was sent to all of the families yesterday. And again, while at home, students would need to follow the district-wide plan. Daily, scheduled, synchronous instruction. We're asking families make a commitment for one semester. That semester ends on January 27th. And the reason for that 
is uh, to make sure that we don't have a revolving door of students coming in and out of the school. We know that there may be families who start the school year and would like their children to uh, move to the remote model. We believe we'll be able to accommodate that, but uh, we're asking for a pretty significant commitment from families that start at home that they remain in the remote plan until the first semester. That way, for the second semester, we can adjust any staffing uh, or class size issues that may come up. And um, as we talk about class size in grades K through five, uh, based on the numbers or the number of, of families that are interested by grade level, they will have their own class section if possible. And at the middle school and high school, students at home will join the class remotely that's taking place at the middle school and the high school. Um, those specifics are outlined in our hybrid learning model. For those who are interested in this parent choice, and we've already heard from a little over 100, uh, we are going to schedule parent meetings um, by, by program, so elementary, middle school, and high school, so you can learn some more, so we can field your questions, so you can feel comfortable about this option. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Margaret Reller, who is our uh, Executive Director for Curriculum Instruction, to fill in any blanks that perhaps I missed. Good evening, everybody. Um, I, I think uh, Joe's done a great job so far with this presentation as it relates to our instructional model. Uh, we uh, are looking at the remote responses uh, several times a day, categorizing them by grade and school so that we can get closer to any decisions we have to make about staffing that model. I know Joe mentioned that if children are remote at middle school and high school, they are following their daily schedule as though they were live. At the elementary level, we are working on a remote schedule that will not exactly mimic the elementary day for a whole host of reasons, not the least of which is that we can't expect little guys to be on the computer all day long. So we will be uh, condensing some of that work, getting it out to teachers for feedback on each grade level, and then that schedule will be shared with parents the first week of school not only for the remote families, but also so that if you are a live family and heaven forbid we need to close for some reason, you have advance notice of what that schedule will look like for your students. Um, aside from that, uh, this is a very fluid situation as I'm sure you are all aware. While we are looking at what parents are asking us for, we also will have the challenge of staffing as we get closer to the start of school. Uh, we're all working together to make sure that this experience is the very best experience that we can provide for our students. And we know that um, you understand the situation and you know what we're uh, answering to as far as the state guidelines and the hopes and wishes of the faculty in our community. We look forward to feedback from you. And uh, as Joe said, we have a, several more forums scheduled to respond to that feedback as we move along through the process. Good, thank you very much. We're gonna move along to our next uh, section that I know is uh, very important to uh, our community and school district and many parents is special education. Uh, I'll give a brief overview and then invite Lisa Shookman to make comment. Uh, all of our special ed programs will may remain intact. Uh, students that ha have an IEP uh, are entitled to those services and those services will continue to be provided. Uh, they'll be provided both live and remote uh, based on either choices that families make. Uh, if they want to uh, have their children begin the school year uh, at home or through a remote model or uh, if by chance we need to close at some point during the school year. Uh, the ABC and the Sailor classes, they will be daily. So uh, in our middle school and high school model, our Hybrid model, it calls for students to attend schools on either Monday and Tuesday or Thursday and Friday. Uh, we are preparing a schedule where ABC uh, students in sailor classes can attend school in person every day. And there's ongoing planning and discussion uh, with the entire mental health team and related service providers to make sure uh, that everyone, especially our faculty, and I, I really want to underscore that, um, everyone is is nervous and struggling this is this is new to everybody 
uh, and we're fielding a lot of comments and working with the various associations to make sure our staff feel safe and comfortable uh, to return and Lisa and her team uh, are making sure to address not only student needs but faculty needs so uh, Lisa would you like to chime in with anything um, yeah, I think you, you hit everything on the head. I think the one thing that I will share is today, um, I actually just finished up an SEL meeting with all of the social workers, psychologists, and some school counselors from each level, um, just to talk about what we're thinking when we return. How can we make sure teachers have access to our mental health teams and they feel comfortable? So we're actually working with um, the Cognitive Behavior um, Clinic out of White Plains, who does our DBT. They will be coming and doing some professional development for all staff, which includes bus drivers, cafeteria, um, school monitors, um, uh, secretaries, anybody that works in the building with kids to just go over some stuff about trauma and what is trauma. And I'm also working with them currently to develop a parent night where parents can get on with a Zoom and, and really go through some ideas. It's called psychological first aid. And what does that trauma mean and what does it look like? Because I think one of the things we all have to think is that we have to have in our mind that all students have some sort of trauma history. That, that way, we will know that students don't fall through the cracks. So we think about that as our students, but we also think about it as our staff, because we want to make sure that we're supporting our staff as much as we're supporting our students, and then we will also be supporting our community and families. So um, be on the lookout for that. As soon as I have more information, we will be posting it on the website, website and um, it'll be free for parents to attend. We're gonna probably do a morning in an evening session or a daytime in an evening session. So as many people that want to attend, can attend. Great, thank you very much. We're gonna move along to our next uh, section of our presentation. We're gonna talk about training and preparedness, a, a major piece uh, of all of the various mandates uh, from those agencies that we mentioned before uh, is around preparedness for staff uh, and students. There's a significant amount of training that students uh, will need to complete uh, in order to participate uh, in in-school events. Uh, our school district, like many others, participate and purchase a service from the Global Compliance Network, GCN. Uh, that's a virtual and also real-time training module. So uh, New York State Schools has a number of annual training requirements that all staff uh, need to complete and even more specific training uh, for certain folks affiliated with the school district. Uh, we use this platform so our staff can uh, go through the courses. Uh, they can go through them at their own time uh, or they can go through them uh, when they have uh, before or after school or when they have some gaps in their schedule. All employees have access to the training modules some have begun the training and others have not, and that's okay. Uh, the question is whether or not uh, we're going to need additional training to be provided upon return, and we're going to. Uh, we can't achieve all of these mandates uh, through a virtual experience. Um, so we're looking at the opening of school, typically when, when teachers and staff come back and we have 100% um, attendance and participation uh, before students come, we use that time to get a lot of training done. Uh, this year, we're going to use even more of that time to get training done, and it's very, very important training. We're talking about contact tracing and how to identify students that don't feel well and what do we do if we feel symptomatic. A whole new level of awareness uh, needs to be brought to everyone in our uh, school community, and we're going to have to uh, use an extensive amount of time to go through that training. We're going to use the expertise of Alteris and BOCES. BOCES has been a phenomenal partner, whether it's with school safety or health matters, and Alteris and BOCES have, have partnered together on a number of, of uh, matters, including our school safety plans and also our Department of Health return to school plan. So uh, the training is not just happening now and it doesn't end when school uh, begins, it's ongoing. And time is a factor, uh, as, I, as I shared. There were some questions posed, you know, why isn't anyone already trained? Uh, what's the delay? What's taking so long? It's important to underscore that the minority of our staff are 12-month employees. The majority of our staff are 10-month employees. And uh, we cannot mandate work or we cannot mandate activities that take place outside of that contractual time limit. Uh, but we do provide it. We give them the opportunity to do that. Um, 
but that's uh, that's one of the reasons um, our teachers are engaged in many many other activities personal or family activities uh, travel uh, caring for uh, family members um, so that is the difference the difference is that uh, most of our training is able to take place right before school starts and we know that we're going to have more significant training that needs to take place uh, Laura Nyer has been uh, coordinating our efforts with GCN and uh, Laura I don't know if you want to weigh in a little bit on that uh, uh, on that um, platform GCN, as you said, is a, um, a service that many school districts do use, and it just, uh, we have, we review all of our trainings with our, um, with legal advice, and also just state requirements and federal requirements. Um, so depending on your position and what you work with, generally we do this every year. We have a lot of mandated trainings, again, based on position in the school district, um, but there have been additional trainings added due to COVID, and this is a fluid process as we will be adding some more trainings as they come to us we can also upload our own custom-made trainings as we see fit in working in collaboration with Anthony Merlini and Enrique Catalan very good thank you okay we're going to speak a little bit about transportation um, Parents uh, have been surveyed a couple times around their uh, comfort level with children riding the bus. Uh, as we get closer to opening the school year, uh, a more formal commitment-based survey will come out of the transportation department. Uh, we need to know how many children are going to ride the bus, how many parents are going to drive their children, or uh, the number of children who are going to use our parent choice remote learning option. So look for a survey shortly uh, so that department can um, uh, get bus runs uh, and capacity organized. There will be mandatory mask wearing on the bus and at the bus stop. Uh, that is a mandate from the CDC and every other uh, authority agency with regards to uh, the Department of Health both at the county and the state. Uh, there will be no more than two students per seat. That is a reduction of ridership or capacity by one-third. However, siblings uh, will be permitted to sit together, and if there are three siblings, they can sit uh, three in a row as long as they're from the same household. Uh, cleaning was a very important theme and a, a topic that families asked us to touch upon today. Buses are going to be cleaned between each run. As you know, we have a multi-tier transportation system, which means we rotate and recycle the same buses uh, throughout the morning and in the same fashion throughout the afternoon, so we have fewer buses uh, on the road. They'll be cleaned at the end of each run, so when students get off the bus, the bus will be cleaned before they pick up their next group of students. And after the entire morning and afternoon runs are complete, uh, every bus will be sanitized uh, using an electrostatic mechanism. And with me is Elizabeth Gillio, our Director of Transportation, and she can uh, fill in some blanks. Sure. So it's just, um, it's important that I know uh, if there are children that are not able to wear masks, uh, that our, those kids are identified so that I can provide them with a smaller vehicle. Um, either they'll be alone on that vehicle or they'll only be with, you know, one or two other students so that they can socially distance. But in the survey, when that comes out, it's just very important that those survey answers come back so that I can, you know, adequately plan for what my transportation routes are going to look like for September. We want to make sure that everybody needs a bus and needs a seat, that they have them, and those children that need to have, uh, you know, special uh, transportation, that uh, that's able to be addressed, and we can meet their needs as well. Uh, we have an organized uh, drop-off for the schools. We're using different locations to drop and pick up students. Uh, that, too, will come out in the plan that goes out uh, prior to school opening. Um, I'm asking that parents do not come on the property when the buses are there, so there will be a later drop for parents and an earlier, uh, later pickup for parents uh, if you're driving your child to and from school and all of that will be communicated uh, prior to school opening. And we're doing that so that we don't have, uh, you know, clusters of children, uh, you know, in different entrances or exits of the building. 
and we can all you know practice social distancing and keep everybody safe thank you all right moving along to our next portion uh, another very important topic and on everyone's minds uh, PPE and safety supplies, uh, Anthony Merlini, who's in charge of our facilities, buildings and grounds, has been working actively with uh, his staff and head custodians uh, throughout the district to make sure that they're um, prepared and that we're meeting uh, all the various uh, new mandates uh, coming down in order for us to open school. Uh, quickly, I'll just highlight that we've ordered a little over 100 three-ply surgical masks. Those will be provided for students and staff. We provided 2,500 face shields for students that need them as well as staff. Uh, N95 masks for nurses. These are medical grade, hospital grade masks that our nurses will, um, will have uh, many of to be able to get through the day. Non-contact thermometers. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about, um, about taking temperatures, but we did order non-contact thermometers in case students are feeling ill uh, or we need to uh, uh, provide some random uh, temperature checks throughout the day, uh, so we, ha we do have a good supply of those. Gowns and medical supplies, again, for our, our nursing uh, folks, uh, in case students do get ill or uh, we need to um, make sure that they're a little more protected based on situations that could arise. And also a bio shield, a 90-day spray. So this is uh, basically a cleaning agent that uh, is, layer, is layered on surfaces and has a 90-day uh, activity rate. And with that, I'll turn it over to Anthony Marlini to fill in any mm -hmm. gaps. Sure. Um, so right now we're working with our suppliers to um, get our supplies and things together and based on the different tables that are in the FCD requirements of what we need to have on supply. So we're working with them, we're working with our vendors, and we're looking at technology that's coming out and changing, et cetera, that's happening every day. Um, the BioShield product that um, Joe was speaking at, at the end there, it is a, um, I can't go into the whole um, chemical compound of it or how it actually works 100%, um, but it, what it does is it lays a layer down onto um, the surfaces and it has a 90 day kill claim. So that basically lays down this carbon surface and anything that comes into contact with these um, surfaces will die off. Um, so we're looking at all these different technologies to help protect everybody and like I said, um, things are changing daily and, and we're trying to stay with everybody and with the technology and do as many things that we can to help ensure that everybody stays safe. Some more information on PPE and safety supplies. Uh, the recommendations are very, very clear to make sure windows and doors are open, uh, bus hatches are popped to create more airflow, uh, to try to get air moving uh, throughout the schools, throughout office spaces, uh, more fresh air uh, is what the, what the goal is. So there are windows that uh, don't have screens, so we're installing screens on those windows to increase ventilation. Uh, we're increasing the me mechanical ventilation where possible. Uh, some of our systems are a little older or aging out, uh, so part of our capital project is we're re replacing some of them and we're making improvements where we can. Also with uh, air filters, uh, we know that there are some new guidelines and recommendations in terms of what sort of air filters that schools and businesses, gymnasiums and theaters should have, so we're improving, uh, we're, we're making significant purchases there to improve uh, the quality of air through the filters. Uh, we're investigating with a number of districts uh, ion generators and I'll let Anthony talk about that in a minute. Uh, but a big piece uh, of our purchasing uh, is our, includes sanitizing. Sanitizers at entrances and classrooms, various public spaces, and certainly a very aggressive signage campaign to remind uh, everyone to wear their mask, to be socially distanced, hand washing, you name it. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Anthony to uh, provide a little more detail. Sure. So there's a lot of questions when it comes to the technology that's out there and what we can and what we can't use inside of a school building. So as you all know, we're, we're basically governed by New York State Education Department and what their engineers and what their staff allows us to do and what they don't allow us to do. So I know there's a lot of questions about using a lot of this technology that's floating out there. And that's all great for 
um, private sector or hospitals or things like that. But when we come to schools, we have to follow the guidelines and mandates that you know oversee us. So if there's something in there that we can use, we use it. If there's something in there that we can't use, we can't use it right now. Um, but we are looking at all that technology to find out what we can do and what we can't do. Um, when it comes to the ion generators and things like that, um, we're investigating that because that's one of the things that's on the fence with SED. Uh, when it comes to sanitizers and things like that, there's things that we can do and we can't do uh, with the alcohol-based sanitizers when they come inside the building, only because we have younger um, individuals that are inside the buildings and people, when they get their hands on certain things, they're, they're not always the best for our young adults. Uh, when it comes to ventilation and mechanical systems um, and filters and things like that, there's a lot of um, restraints that we can and we can't do only because of the nature of the mechanical equipment that's inside the building. So where we can and we can do put bigger filters in or um, higher MERV rated filters in, we're doing that. And where we can't, we're looking at other um, means to increase airflow or do things so we can uh, provide a better environment for our students and staff when they're inside the building. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to move on to talk about our uh, technology tools and training and support. Uh, I'm actually just going to turn this right over to Laura Nyer, and Laura, just let me know when you want me to turn the slide. Uh, a lot of really good information here uh, around improving our uh, remote uh, system. I know that, as I said earlier, um, there was a concern that uh, student experience wasn't necessarily equitable last spring. <clears throat> we had some teachers who uh, were very proficient and uh, did a great job transitioning on short notice, and we had some, some staff who um, needed more time to transition. However, uh, the circumstance at the time was we were provided with two days. So. Uh, Laura, with um, working with Margaret and Lisa and a number of other staff, uh, have continued uh, to improve not only the software and hardware of our technology, but also the training and support, uh, and to model that as well. So Laura, I'll turn these slides over to you. Sure. So um, as you said, you know, we, we have been a district that has always been forefront in, in technology for education and instructional tools being a Google school, having our teachers come on um, just as part of their probationary period, be having to become Google certified. So we were ahead of the game to say when all this rolled out, but nobody had anticipated or planned for learning to be remote and to take these tools that they had learned so well to utilize in the classroom to be completely at home. Um, so there's sort of two parts. We have the tools of the technology, and then we also have the pedagogy and the practice. So one of the first things we wanted to ensure was that we had enough technology for all of our students. Um, in the spring, we, we were not a one-to-one -one school. We did not have enough devices for every single student at all times, or many of our devices might have been outdated. Um, we had been in the process of a uh, five-year cycle where we were uh, creating one-to-one -one environments, uh, but at that point we only had the three elementary schools and the middle school and high school had not yet reached that point. So um, not that I could predict the future, but knowing that, um, or planning for the worst, which is sometimes what we have to do, um, we were able to purchase enough Chromebooks that we now have a touchscreen Chromebook for every student um, for the upcoming school year K-12. through We found that the touchscreen devices uh, gave us a lot more flexibility in the type of instruction and the feedback and the assessments we could be using with kids, whether they were in the building or they were remote. Um, so with that, every single kid will have the touchscreen device. And then the other important thing was, was staff. So we were trying to support staff and ensuring that they were following school policies, using school provided devices, but we didn't have all of that in the spring. So we now are happy to say that we have a um, touch screen Chromebooks um, that are uh, um, a little bit different than the student ones that are designed for the teachers so that every instructional staff member will have a touch screen Chromebook that, so they can also do a lot of modeling and a lot of the learning that needs to happen again whether in the classroom or remote. We are looking to be purchasing more document cameras. Um, we're working with HAC 
HACEF, um, actually on getting styluses for every student, every teacher, trying to create just those tools that teachers and students have so they can kind of check that off the box. Um, with that comes the concern about internet. So we were really grateful that in the spring, a lot of most of the internet providers provided free internet for those who needed it. Not every household had internet activity that could maybe withstand many people online at one time or even have internet at all. So um, with the help of HACEF and the public library, last spring we worked on um, a, a grant so that the library was able to purchase hotspots that we are now going to be assigning to students that do need this um, and are identified by the specific school buildings. With that as well, we had to plan for the fact that we are going to have a lot more people online in the district. So if teachers are having every single student with a Chromebook in front of them or at home or running Google Meet, we needed to increase the bandwidth. So we also just recently doubled our bandwidth. Um, again, more tools of the trade are some of the software that teachers found they really found useful in working with kids and our goal was to identify less but more so we didn't want to have too many different applications and too many different types of software to over confuse the students and the families when they're trying to support them at home and the teachers so we have an amazing group of tech coaches we have 20 tech coaches across the district k through 12 and from the start of this in the spring, there were a lot of sessions with them, just gathering feedback from them. And then this summer, we also have a team of tech coaches that I'm working with to really kind of narrow down our focus of what we need to make learning a better experience this coming fall. So some of those examples or are, are programs like CAMI, which is a program where kids can write directly onto the screen, onto the form. Um, if it's a math problem, the teacher can then write directly back on their screen back. Um, things like Seesaw, where there's some interaction and able to do some reporting. So these are things we're working on right now with the tech coaches. Um, and then, of course, um, just another, another tool, we've always had Google Education for free. And we were able to access Google Meet for free um, during the beginning of this pandemic. However, a lot of these services will not be free come July 1. Some of them have already been cut off for us. Google Meet will end at the end of September. So we are now put in a situation where we need to purchase Google Enterprise for education, which is gonna provide a lot of positive things for us. It will allow a lot more enhancements to what Google Meet uh, offered pr prior, which will include things like breakout rooms so teachers can assign small groups, attendance, hand raising. On the back end, it's going to allow, allow us to have a lot more analytics and data of what students are logging in, when they're logging in, teachers logging in, things like that. Um, and then also just how we manage classrooms. So we've been using Google Classroom for so many years with great success. Um, however, we realized that we needed a little bit more at the high school. And um, we made the decision to move towards Schoology. I actually just spent the day today with our high school tech coaches and administration, uh, learning a lot about the ins and outs of Schoology. And so far, the feedback has been phenomenal. Um, <clears throat> so it is sort of, you know, a Google Classroom with a facelift. So it's going to allow for a lot more ease of integration, um, ability to sort of organize and help with executive functioning. At K through eight, the um, the buildings and the teachers and the tech tech coaches have decided to stick with Google Classroom for now because they can access a lot of the things they need with some of the other applications we offered. Uh, so again, these are just the tools. There's so much that goes behind it, um, but we wanted to make sure that we had those basics down. So with whatever situation we're in or wherever students are, they have the proper tools. So Joe, I'll jump to the the next slide. Yep. There you go. So, you know, training and support is really important. And like I said, we, we have a lot of training that goes on. And normally three times a year, we run Google Level 1, Level 2 certification courses for our, our staff. We do refresher courses. Our tech coaches are usually sent to trainings or they receive online trainings and they turn key that to the staff. So we're just, we're, we're, we're highlighting and focusing them even more right now. And like I said, we've been spending time this summer meeting and working with tech coaches to really be the, um, 
the representatives of the students that they worked with, the teachers that they work with, um, and the families that they've communicated with to, to help guide us in what we're purchasing, what we can get for free, what we can use, what's gonna be the most effective. Um, one thing we definitely identified was that, you know, last spring we had created an internal website, which was a uh, source of guides and resources and tutorials that maybe we create, we called from the internet or maybe our own tech coaches made the tutorial for four staff members. So we're gonna be building on that and we're enhancing that, that website for our staff. And we're constantly gonna be adjusting it as we see needed. But what we realized was we really wanted to provide more support for family and students. So we have created a website where um, students or parents can go in and find the exact resources, the exact guide. How do I use Cadme? How do I help my child with Flipgrid? Whatever the resource may be and make them very user friendly. Uh, we're also creating schedules of office hours. So this works for staff already, but if you need, if there's a parent or a child who just needs some help figuring out the tool and how to access it so it doesn't hinder their learning experience, uh, tech coaches will be available on uh, schedules that we will promote so that they can sign up and get that one-to-one -one support. Um, and additionally, our IT help desk was available all spring in multiple languages. There's a form online on the Instructional Technology website that they can go to, and we'll still be maintaining and answering that for any sort of IT support. You know, how do I, you know, there's something wrong with my Chromebook. It doesn't seem to be powering up. And sometimes we're able to actually screen connect to that person's device and be able to identify what the issues may be. And right now we're beginning the process or we've begun the process of deploying Chromebooks. In the spring we asked for families that had a touchscreen Chromebook to keep it. We did not want to have people drop Chromebooks off to then have them picked up again. Um, so we, the Chromebooks we did receive were the ones that are non-touch and we did want to make sure that we could clean them and quarantine them appropriately. Now we are deploying Chromebooks to those who do not have one. Um, and we're asking that every student take a Chromebook and we're doing it by school so we can better manage our inventory since we're doing it by building. Um, so you might have a, a child, children in three different buildings, but you will have three different pickups just again because we're managing the inventory per building. Um, and there's a lot of information on the instructional technology website which talks about the one-to-one -one device program. There is um, an updated consent form we ask parents to sign. We are providing insurance if people would like to buy insurance for their devices. Um, and I'm also working with HHCEF to help support those families in need that may need cases or insurance or any other support when it comes to the Chromebook. Great. Thank you very much, Laura. Hello. We will move on to another very important piece of this puzzle of returning to school, testing and contact tracing. As I mentioned uh, earlier, the governor made some comments last week suggesting schools were going to conduct COVID testing, and it's very important we underscore that we will not do that. Uh, we're not permitted to do that. We don't have qualified personnel to do that. The Westchester County Department of Health, however, uh, will play quarterback throughout the entire process. Uh, they're going to coordinate all of the COVID testing and tracing. They have a team of folks um, who will, who are uh, contact tracers. They'll work through the Department of Health and work with the school district. They'll tell us um, who we can communicate with and what we can communicate to families and students and staff. They, the county, are going to notify individuals uh, of results. And it's important to underscore that um, that is a, that, that's a, a private medical record uh, that if someone tests positive, uh, we have uh, a duty and a responsibility under the plan to notify families and notify students and notify staff, but not to identify who exactly tested positive. Um, they will also, the County of Health will, will uh, direct the district to close or quarantine, etc. They will make that decision based on their contact tracing. The district will not. Uh, they will determine based on who the individual may have had um, personal uh, experiences with or um, how the uh, virus may have spread within an office space, a classroom, 
uh, or a bus, but they will be the ones to direct us when to close for cleaning or when to quarantine uh, because uh, perhaps it spread uh, in a significant fashion. Uh, they also will play quarterback and direct families of who should get tested and what their quarantine method should be. Uh, it had always been 14 days. Uh, now if you're asymptomatic, it might be 10 days. And they're going to advise families of how to return to school. There will be documentation that students will need to uh, give to the school district in order for them to uh, re-enter instruction. Uh, in our hybrid learning plan, we highlighted a situation uh, a student vignette a day in the life and I believe it was our high schooler on what happens that uh, if a student feels ill during the day and goes home um, and you know maybe takes a test and is negative or even if he or she is positive the beauty of the hybrid learning plan is that child or any other child who may be home with uh, symptomatic uh, uh, conditions or even uh, testing positive they can rejoin their classroom remotely immediately. Uh, they can log right in with the computers that Laura talked about and they can make sure that they remain connected uh, to the classroom if they choose to, based, in, uh, based of course on their symptoms. Uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, to please consult our district website. We have a lot of information um, that we posted. We have a multi-page, it uh, looks like it's a seven-page Q&A. Uh, from the county with very specific uh, scenarios and different information that uh, they provided schools and asked that we provide to you. Uh, that was based on a conversation we had with the county on Monday morning. Uh, as I said, the governor made some suggestions that school districts would be more intimately involved in the actual protocol of testing. Uh, we were able to meet with our friends at the county early Monday morning and uh, by uh, Within 24 hours, we got this document that we wanted to share with everyone. So please make sure uh, you reference that regularly and frequently because that is uh, one of the top items and, and one of the top issues uh, that was uh, reported to us by, by families. Uh, the next piece is, and our last piece, budget and finance. So this is a sort of how are we doing financially um, when the uh, pandemic began and schools were closed back in March. Uh, we were uh, almost through our budget planning process. We really didn't know or didn't know what to expect in terms of uh, the duration of the closure. As you remember, the governor closed uh, schools in New York State for two weeks at a time on three separate occasions and then uh, closed schools for the rest of the year in early May. Uh, by that time, our budget was pretty, uh, pretty well set, but we wanted to share with you uh, some of our expenses uh, in gearing up and getting ready for the school year. Uh, you heard Anthony Merlini talk about all of the different uh, enhancements and improvements uh, to the physical plant. Uh, so far, we've spent approximately $300,000 on various supplies, materials, and equipment. Uh, our signage campaign that's mandated from the Department of Health, we're estimating uh, an additional $50,000 to print uh, and post the signage as well as the, the requisite training that I mentioned early on. Uh, at least another $10,000 in software. This is a, a screening software, basically a phone app that we will provide for families uh, where they will conduct a basic screening that is uh, in conjunction with the CDC and Department of Health in order for students to come to school. Uh, that's very, very important. So parents will uh, have an app to attest that their uh, child or children do not show symptoms of COVID-19. Uh, after that is uh, identified and signified on the app, the school will receive a report and we'll be able to cross-check uh, students who are coming to school based on those who completed the app. So that's another at least $10,000. And that's uh, really for the first six weeks of, of our fiscal year. And we anticipate um, you know, to be able to replace uh, different supplies and materials and continue to do the work throughout the district. We're probably going to be north of $1 million in terms of uh, our financial commitment to making sure our schools are ready. And with that, I'll turn it over to Enrique Catalan, our Assistant Superintendent for Business, to uh, speak in some more detail. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, community. On the budget, as Joe mentioned, uh, if the situation stays for the whole school year, we're expecting to spend about $1 million more in 
equipment in maintaining a healthy environment throughout all our um, all our departments, all our buildings, uh, buses, etc. Uh, I believe that these million dollars will will not be an over budget because obviously there are going to be some other expenses that we will not do, we will not um, incur due to the fact that we'll have less less uh, children in school. Um, we are at this point we are planning to have all our teachers back, to have most of our activities back. Uh, we still don't know about athletics and uh, extra curriculum. Uh, we'll know in a couple of weeks uh, if the governor decides that there's going to be a fall season for athletics and extra curriculum. So uh, I believe that still we're going to be on budget. Um, there's no reason to, to think that uh, financially we'll be doing well during the year. All right, thank you very much. I want to uh, start to wrap up by just uh, reviewing some of our uh, expectations about how different and unique and new this school year will be and certainly gearing up for it. Um, I think it's important to underscore that as we get ready to come back to school in September, this is not a return to normal. I know that during uh, the pandemic and, and we were very, very close to the epicenter, you know, we were all longing for the days we could uh, see each other again and go shopping and be at the beach and travel and all of those good things. Um, coming back to school in Hendrick Hudson or Croton or Yorktown or you name it is not coming back to the school and having the experience that children had last year. And it's important that we underscore that. Uh, we have to have a, a, a reality check that things are going to be different for hopefully temporarily for a little while. Um, they're going to be a little more rigid uh, because of the systems and the structures that we have to put in place. But they also may be a little more independent uh, as students or families elect to stay home and allow their children to uh, engage in learning remotely. Uh, it's going to feel different, it's going to be different, um, and we're on a, a very quick learning curve where we're making many, many decisions in a short period of time to try to make the experience as normal as possible uh, because when students show up, we want them to feel cared for, we want them to feel nurtured, and we want to make sure that they're enjoying themselves. So it's, it's important to um, just come back to that mindset and also that we still are in a pandemic. Um, a lot of families that have had to cancel trips to Florida or the Outer Banks or even for a short period of time to Delaware and uh, Ocean City and the shores of Maryland. Um, we are not out of this yet and uh, if you look at just the map of the hot spots, um, it started where we are, it went west and then it came, it looks, appears to be coming back up through the south. So it's important that uh, we're vigilant and that we continue to uh, follow all the guidelines that we're asked to. And perhaps most important is um, we're designing school and creating experience to control the spread. It goes back to a comment I made earlier about why there are no meetings in person or why we weren't able to have a graduation ceremony for the class of 2020. Um, why sixth grade or ninth grade orientation or kindergarten orientation is different. Um, that's because we're creating a new system uh, around these health concerns as opposed to relying on the system that we have always relied on for decades. And what that has created uh, in a short period of time is a lot of anxiety uh, and a lot of stress because we're redesigning the school experience right now. Um, we're trying to replicate an in-classroom experience to make it as seamless as possible if and when students can come back to school, uh, but we know it's going to be different. And if we're honest with each other, there are going to be many, many times throughout the school year that we're moving between in-person instruction and remote instruction. And, and that's going to be based on students or staff uh, who are symptomatic or test positive. It's going to be based on guidance. Uh, from agencies out of our control, the CDC or perhaps the State Education Department or the Governor. 
So we're doing something um, that public schools haven't had to do forever. And we're doing it in a very truncated period of time. We're doing it with uh, a lot of eyes watching us and with great expectations as they should be. Um, but we want to make sure that, that people understand uh, some of the stress and the pressure on the system as well as understanding, we understand the stress, of the stress and pressure at home. Uh, as we wrap up here, uh, some considerations uh, for our school community. These are conversations um, that we're all having. Uh, we're having them on social media, we're having them on the phone or email or however we're socializing with each other. Um, a lot of questions. Uh, parents are asking if the remote model, the parent choice model, is right for them. Uh, we're going to have a series of, of uh, meetings to talk expressly about what that will look like at the elementary, middle school, and high school. Uh, a conversation with your child about is he or she comfortable returning to school? It's a very important conversation to have and to set the expectation and it's going to look different, it's going to feel different. Um, it's not like putting, uh, putting our kids on the bus on the Tuesday after Labor Day and expect them to um, have the same experience that, that they've had for a significant numbers of year, number of years. Are, are, is your child, are your children comfortable with remote learning? We know that we had some hiccups last year. We also know we had some great successes and we wanted to highlight those. Our goal uh, since last March, is, as Laura and Margaret and Lisa mentioned, was to improve that system as we went. We had a duty and obligation to do that. Uh, and with it being very uh, plausible, and certainly as some parents choose to start remote, um, that's going to be the expectation. The expectation is going to be excellence and that students who have a remote learning experience uh, are engaged. Uh, they feel that they uh, have interaction with their teacher and their friends and, and those in their classroom. It's going to look different. And again, um, it's not a return to normalcy. We remain in this really uh, tough conundrum and situation uh, in terms of it being a pandemic. And the question that we've been asking uh, around uh, the halls of Hendrick Hudson, uh, so to speak, is do we, do we need more time? Um, as I said earlier, many districts have adjusted their calendar for the first number of weeks of school. A number of districts adjusted their calendar for the first month of school. Uh, we have been in constant communication with the teachers union, with our administrators, uh, with the secretaries association, the custodians, the teacher aides and monitors, uh, everybody to ask them how they feel about returning. Uh, because if, uh, if they don't feel comfortable returning, uh, as the governor said, if we don't have staff, then we don't have school. And those are uh, some, some really important conversations that school districts haven't had to have before. And I can tell you that we're having them. Um, Laura and Enrique, who, who share HR duties, in our district are, are meeting with our staff who, who are scared, who are nervous, uh, who really uh, aren't sure um, whether they're healthy enough to come back given the enormity of the unknowns uh, that we're all confronting. So that's gonna be a question we're gonna continue to ask and we're gonna study. Uh, as we do that, we'll continue to press on. We'll have another session uh, tomorrow at 4 p.m., uh, similar, identical format, and uh, if you haven't been able to make those, we could see you Monday night at 6 p.m. Uh, all of these conversations are going to be recorded. Uh, they'll be put on our YouTube channel, which also goes to our website. Uh, so if you couldn't make it or you have a friend that didn't make it, please uh, let them know that this will be up on the website in short order. And also to send any questions in so we can try to um, Customize tomorrow and the presentation on the 17th uh, to what those what those needs are and what those questions are. So thank you for joining us. I want to thank our team for uh, outstanding planning and our staff, our principals, our custodians, our secretaries. Um, everyone's doing what they can uh, to do the right thing for our community, do the right thing for our kids, to make sure that they have an outstanding school year, whatever that looks like. Uh, but we'll continue to press on uh, and we'll continue to keep, keep you informed and also receive your uh, input and feedback 